Bill, I'm going to begin with you. Uh, you've recruited Larry here and several other top multinational CEOs as anchor partners for your effort to develop critical clean energy technologies. Let's start with this. What is Breakthrough Energy Catalyst? And what will it do with the money these partners are providing you? Well, it's very exciting uh, that we've got seven founding partners here for Catalyst. Uh, these are companies that care about climate and even beyond uh, getting rid of their own emissions are helping to support the projects that will reduce the costs of making things like uh, aviation fuel or hydrogen. And so it's not just their emissions that will be impacted here. As we take this over billion dollars in capital we already have, and that's just the start, and fund these projects, we're going to bring the cost down so that you know, all companies and all countries uh, will be able to participate in using green products. So I saw this as a key element. Uh, I first uh, went to Satya Nadella, uh, then, you know, seeing how out in front uh, Larry's been on this issue, I went to him. And so the two of them uh, encouraged me to get a, a group together. And now uh, we've got five other companies who are leaders in this space. Uh, announcing substantial commitments, you know, so we start with over a billion dollars to help fund the scale up projects that will bring the cost down. And there's a lot of leverage here because there'll be government money, government tax credits uh, that will pull together uh, dozens of these projects. And you've got, if I understand it, in addition to Microsoft and BlackRock, you've got Bank of America, you've got General Motors, you've got BCG, ArcelorMittal, I may be missing one, American Airlines. Now, Those are the, the seven founding partners who are going to help guide this effort. Uh, we do expect to bring in lots more companies. We have announced that Catalyst also is working with governments, the EU and the United States announced that they see this effort as very complementary. And so designing these projects well, which if government was doing it by itself, you wouldn't have the breadth of expertise you need. So. Uh, our expertise, the company's expertise with the governments, uh, you know, are taking a lot of recovery money. Uh, Europe, you know, has committed a lot of capital. The Congress is debating uh, substantial money in the two different bills there uh, that if those go through, will allow this effort to go uh, full speed. Larry, you're one of the first people Bill approached in his effort to get this off the ground? What convinced you to support him and to support Catalyst? Well, um, Eric, as you know, I've always been a student and a student of the world. And a few years ago when I realized that um, climate risk is investment risk and, um, and as a fiduciary to all our clients' uh, capital that we're managing, it was very clear to me that I needed to spend more time learning about why climate risk is investment risk. Um, in addition, um, it was very clear to me that we're not moving fast enough as a world, a, lo a lot of conversation. Uh, and as Bill suggested, we need to rapidly find ways of bringing down the green premium uh, to move to a more sustainable world. Um, at this moment, we're spending more time focusing on moving the green world. And I just think if, if we don't find the new technologies very rapidly, it's going to be highly inflationary to, to get to a green world. And we're, not, and we're going to leave many parts of society behind. So it, it, it became very real to me that we needed to be focused on investing um, in new technologies very rapidly. Uh, and importantly, though, we needed to invest in, in new technology that may not turn out good. We needed to be investing in new technologies at the very onset of these technologies. Some of them may work, and if they work, they're going to be probably enterprises and ideas and companies that maybe BlackRock could fund later on with our corporate money, with our, I mean, our, our client money. But at this time, it was very important for us in, in our position as an organization to put our capital to work through our foundation to really start accelerating the idea of science and technology coming forward to rapidly try to find solutions to move, as Bill said, to uh, green biofuels, uh, uh, to green cement and, and green steel. If we can do that rapidly, we can meet the targets uh, of the of Paris Accord. And if we don't move fast enough to get there is going to be highly um, 
inflationary and importantly it's going to create more social issues uh, throughout the world and importantly there it's hard for me to see without moving towards a more green world it's hard for me to see how the emerging world will participate in this unless we could bring down the green premium and so i understand it properly it's a grant out of the blackrock foundation and not client capital or shareholder capital on the balance sheet because at this point there's still too much risk involved, too much risk of failure, too much risk of loss? All of that, but also importantly, we're not doing this to make money. We're doing this to, to seed these ideas, to rapidly accelerate ideas, and hopefully one or two or three or many, many more ideas turn into real su substantive ideas. And if they need a, a round, a, a different types of rounds of financing because it's real, you know, at that time, maybe uh, we could bring in uh, client money. This is this is really meant to seed ideas, seed new technologies, to rapidly move forward. And the more we could move this forward, the, the faster, in my mind, we could have more client money to invest side by side. Our objective in this is not pro uh, profit seeking. Our objective in this is to uh, to really rapidly find the new technologies so we could move forward. Uh, with a more green horizon. And without that, I, I, it's hard for me to see that. Private, there's, a, there's large pools of money to be invested in sustainability. But in most cases, as fiduciaries, they need to have some return on that. So this is not meant to be a, an investment for return. And importantly, when we built out our foundation, we said the two areas that we're, we're gonna focus on was in climate and in financial literacy. And we did a lot of work on where did we want to really emphasize the foundation's money in terms of climate. And breakthrough was the was really obvious to us once we understood what breakthrough was trying to do. And we believe it really fits in quite nicely in our philanthropic views, but also it's going to help us to be more informed. Uh, in the science and the technology of the advancement of green technology so we can be better investors in the future. Bill, uh, of the $1 billion plus that's coming from these seven initial anchor partners, uh, how much of it is philanthropic capital like BlackRock's and how much of it is, is other sources of funding and financing, other types, let's say? Uh, we're mixing uh, grant money, uh, modest return equity money, and then what we call offtake, where companies can say, okay, when you have these uh, projects, say, to make green hydrogen, they're willing to buy it, uh, and that price will be above what today's dirty hydrogen is, uh, so that you're able to do these initial projects. The model here is what happened with wind and solar and lithium ion. Those products had very high prices compared to conventional techniques. And fortunately, uh, Germany, Japan, other buyers uh, funded the scale up. And now those products fit the normal sort of client investing metrics. You know, those are mature and they're in this big scale up phase. The four areas we picked here, green hydrogen, sustainable aviation fuel, storage and direct air capture are at a much earlier stage where they have a very high green premium, but by designing scale-up projects with catalyst capital uh, and government uh, capital, we will learn, uh, you know, deploy these innovations, pick the right approach, and get that premium down uh, in the same way happening in those other areas. So over this ne next decade, we need all the green technologies uh, that you know, can reduce in every type of emission uh, to get to where solar and wind are. Uh, and so we get for the, the 20 years after that uh, the, into this high speed scale up and we're tapping into literally, you know, hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars. But this upfront design of the projects uh, to pick the right partners, places and bring those, those costs down uh, these are four technologies that are ready for that. In fact, we just put out uh, a solicitation for people to say which projects would they like us uh, to partner uh, now that we have over a, a billion dollars in capital. So I would just add one thing, Eric. 
Sure, please. You know, unlike when, when Bill talked about uh, the, the pathway for solar and wind, that was a 30 year pathway to bring it competitive to hydrocarbons. We don't have 30 years. We don't have 10 years. Uh, and, and so to me, this is about the acceleration of the science and technology. This is about really emphasizing these, these areas where we have to focus if we're going to get to a net zero world. Uh, Bill, you've said that avoiding a climate disaster will require a new industrial revolution. For many, as you know, the hope now that wind and solar have been proven was that the next generation of clean energy technology would be economically viable on its own without philanthropy, without subsidies. Is that not the case in these kinds of problems that are so capital intensive? Today, many areas of emissions like making steel and cement uh, or aviation fuel, the green premium is very high in many cases, almost double the price. And so if we try and do this brute force, only the richest countries or companies will be able to offset their emissions. Now, it's great that they're willing to do that, but we call it catalyst because by taking the resources and funding these projects, we're going to make it affordable for all companies and all countries mm -hmm. to take the green approach <clears throat> because we'll either get the green premium down to zero which as you say for solar and wind that's where we are and so now it's just accelerating the the scale up deployment uh, of that gigantic electricity grid but a lot of people aren't aware that you know passenger cars with the lithium ion batteries and electric generation that's where we've made the most project progress but that's only a third of the emissions. And so that's why getting these other areas of emissions uh, to be priced either close to competitive or uh, actually completely competitive, that is the highest priority. Uh, and so going into Glasgow, you know, having this partnership, including with the governments as well, uh, making this concrete, I think, you know, it shows the momentum that climate's gaining and it, you know, shows that we really aren't ignoring the fact that India and other middle income countries uh, at today's state of the art, they won't uh, deny the, the electricity and the shelter to their citizens uh, that uh, going for uh, today's green pre premium would imply. So I, I view this as a critical next step. Larry, you've spent a lot of time thinking, writing, and speaking about climate risk. What in your mind is at stake if these projects, these projects in green hydrogen and sustainable jet fuel, long-term battery storage and carbon capture, what's at stake if they don't get this kind of funding? Well, they don't get it done, uh, then we are, we are gonna have more risk uh, as societies, we're going to have more issues related to rising climate uh, and, and importantly, which will create more societal issues. Already, we're seeing an impact in society right now from climate risk and climate change. We are seeing insurance premiums uh, going up 18% a year right now. So we're seeing a real impact from what climate risk is doing from, from, from flooding, from fires. So we're seeing a big impact. And so the faster that we could find ways to mitigating the rising temperatures, I would say the more just society could be. And so to me, it's, 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 we don't have much time. And this is why uh, when I learned about Catalyst and I learned about what Bill was doing, it was very clear to me why we needed to be a part of this, why we needed to, to invest the time and the money and the, the key is also the time because we need to be learning about these new uh, the new technologies and how to move forward and we need to then inform our investors ultimately where we think uh, the next opportunities are going to be too and uh, as, as bill bill in his book wrote about we, we need to employ 50 trillion dollars to get to a uh, to a green world uh, that with the rising deficits that we see in governments from our perspective, the 50 trillion is mostly going to have to come from the private sector. 
And I do believe that money will be well spent, well spent for returns. It will transform our economies. Uh, it will build new jobs. It will build, build new uh, cities and new, opp new opportunities. So I look at this as an optimist. I don't look at this as a pessimist, but, but the key is to be that optimist. We have to jump on it now. We have to be investing today. We need to talk about it today, although a lot, much of the problem is in the future. But we're seeing more and more evidence of the problem today. Bill, can we talk about the practicality of these projects and the timeline involved? What is ready now or in the near future for this last mile financing? And when will we see some of these projects get off the ground? Uh, we'll be funding over the next year projects in each area, uh, probably several in each area. And the cat catalyst contribution uh, will be to help the design of the project and you know pulling in uh, making sure that on a global basis, a project is designed well enough to really reduce the costs meaningfully. Catalysts will be, you know, maybe 10% of the funding of particular projects. And so I expect, uh, you know, we were already in preliminary discussions, but we'll have formal applications uh, coming in before the end of the year. And then a lot of grants as we grow this starting 1 billion up to over 3 billion, we would expect, mm -hmm. uh, we'll be doing a lot of funding during calendar 2022. And then with that $3 billion of catalytic capital, what can you do? I presume that that, that will back up some debt financing, for example. If this is done on a project by project basis, how much more could you mobilize? What, what could we be talking about? I know it's not 50 trillion, but what could we be talking about in terms of the impact financially of this catalyst program? Well, the European Union in their recovery funds, over 100 billion of that is labeled for climate projects. Uh, in the two bills in front of Congress, there's over 100 billion between financing of these types of uh, early stage projects and tax credits related to these technologies. And so uh, the leverage of you know, governments who wanna create new industries and create those jobs you know, and transition the hydrocarbon jobs over to say a big green hydrogen industry, uh, their interest is very strong. Historically complex engineering projects, if the government does that alone, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily pull in uh, the small company technologies. And so we'll play a, a role making sure that those designs are, are done very well. But the catalyst capital will be uh, as a percentage, not the big piece. The government money uh, will be there. And then as we've said, as the green premium gets to a low level, that's when you unless, unleash market-driven investment. And that's when you go from, you know, B billions to T trillions. It, and what's the timeline for that? Getting the green premium down to a reasonable level. If, if this is successful, if some of these projects do prove themselves, are we talking about five years, 10 years, 15, 20? At least a few of them, given the uh, breakthrough technologies being developed, you know, Green hydrogen could get down to a very low price within three or four years. Um, sustainable aviation fuel, there's quite a few approaches there. The one that's the hardest is direct air capture because that mainly has an environmental benefit. It's not a product uh, you know, like uh, the other three are. And so that one, uh, I, you know, I'd say it's over the next 10 years that we need to drive that down. But the other three, I'd be very disappointed if we don't see a dramatic reduction in the green premium, even in less than five years, because that should let us do two rounds of projects, the first projects, and then take the learning from those first two and a half years and do a second round that will bring the cost down even further. And the governments, you know, a lot of that money that's been allocated has to be spent in a defined time period. And so, you know, getting Catalyst going uh, now is very, very timely. We need this private sector engagement. And in some ways, uh, you know, the, these private sector companies we have represent such a depth of expertise 
that it's going to be easy for the governments to benefit from that as opposed to going to each company individually. Eric, I would add one thing. Please. Once the technology or a project shows commercial application that we could actually fundamentally bring down the green premium, the amount of private capital that would be running towards these projects would be enormous. The amount of capital that's standing by right now looking to put money to work in, in these types of strategies is enormous. Now we need to make sure that we're proving it. We need to make sure that it's reliable and we could build it. And so I, I'm not frightened about where the money's coming from. I just want to make sure that we have the science and technology and the viability. Once we know that, the capital will be there. Is that just ESG money or is that any risk seeking capital regardless of you know, what the people behind it think about climate risk? I, w I would say within five years, climate is just going to be another risk factor across all investing. Uh, we may not even have ESG investing anymore because ESG is just another risk characteristic of like everything else we have. And I, so, I, so I, would, I would say uh, all investors where they see an opportunity to invest in projects that will transform a society that has great upside, the amount of capital uh, will be there. At, right now I'm talking about more of its ESG capital, but I'm very confident um, if we can prove the technology and the technology works, if we bring down uh, in, a, in, a, in a substantive way the green premium, the capital will be there. And I don't care how we define the capital. There will be it'll be capital seeking opportunities to make a good risk adjusted return for the investors. And for both of you, you've been partners in this effort to recruit other CEOs. I'd like you to tell me a little bit about the feedback you've gotten, the level of enthusiasm or not. What are people saying and what can we expect from the two of you in the months ahead? Are you optimistic that you'll be able to bring other leaders, other companies into this project? Yeah. Well, I, I would let me start off because Bill has been working behind the scenes for a long time on this. Um, and I've been, I've been playing maybe the, uh, the color coordinator or, or the backup. Um, uh, Bill has been very instrumental in all these conversations and I've been uh, able to fill in where uh, where the relationships I had have had I've had a few a few of the partners that I've had from some very serious conversations. Um, I believe these companies, but importantly the companies that have not signed up, but I believe will sign up, understand what we're trying to do. They believe in the found the the science foundation of what Catalyst is. This is not just a venture fund. This is really about using philanthropic money or using capital that would be below market rate capital to try to accelerate uh, a private sector solution alongside the government. Um, and so it's a pretty easy story. Um, the commitments that every firm is making in, in many cases is a large commitment. And, and there may be more of that, but I do believe uh, in my conversations um, it actually accelerates uh, the conversation within these companies. And in most cases, they're, they're all saying, we want to be a part of it. Yeah, I'd so, say the private sector engagement in climate versus, say, 2015 uh, at the time of the Paris talks, it's improved dramatically. And so if you step back, you know, no, we don't have the total solution to this incredible problem. But the momentum, both on the... Uh, rate of innovation and uh, large parts of the private sector saying they have to be part of the solution. These seven are in the vanguard. You know, we hope to get uh, over 20 companies uh, to be key partners in this effort. And uh, I don't think that'll be super hard. Larry's been a, a huge help. Bill, this for you as well. There are a lot of climates out, the climate announcements out there that, that look a lot like Swiss cheese, right? There, there are all kinds of holes in them. Tell people, is this real? We're talking about real money here. We're talking about actual dollars that are going to be deployed in real world projects that are going to deliver real world solutions. Yeah, I'm a you know, practical person. I love uh, the space. You know, I'm only involved to, uh, you know, come up with real solutions. Uh, you know, I'm very impressed with the sincerity of the companies and the, the teams. You know, they have great people that they're putting into their uh, climate work. You know, 
advising BlackRock advising on how this is going to we can structure this financially is great. Uh, somebody like Acceler Metal, you know, understands the steel business better than anyone and have some great technical experts. So, you know, this is a real thing. Uh, this is the next stage is to get these projects going and the governments need help to direct all that money uh, to recreate the successes that uh, uh, have gotten us to this point. 